look at all the maintenance crews and all of the 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 various you know uh, hubs that they're in where you have to take care of these robo taxis and just imagine we have a billion robots mm -hmm. it's going to be the largest repair industry on the planet so that's Jensen Huang, CEO and founder of NVIDIA, speaking on the No Priors podcast. And what stood out to me in this interview, and the reason I'm covering it for you guys, is the fact that he pushes back on almost every major AI narrative going around right now. The idea that AI kills jobs, that we're in some massive AI bubble, and that one all-knowing god AI is just around the corner. Instead, he lays out a very different picture of what's actually happening right now and which industries are going to feel it first. Let's get into it. All right, so let's start with the question everyone keeps asking. Are we in an AI bubble? Here's how Jensen Huang thinks about it. If generative AI, well, excuse me, if chatbots, let's just go, you know, open AI and Anthropic and Gemini, if none of that existed today, NVIDIA would be a multi-hundred billion dollar company. And the reason for that is because, as you know, the foundation of computing is shifting mm -hmm. to accelerated computing. That's the first thing to, to realize is, is to take a step back and ask yourself, what is actually happening? Now the next layer up. The question about AI now becomes, what is AI? Now we ask that, we ask the AI bubble question and we always go back to open AI's revenues. A hundred percent, don't we? Mm -hmm. You ask somebody, hey, is there an AI bubble? Everybody goes directly to OpenAI's revenues. First of all, if OpenAI currently has twice the capacity, their revenues would double. You guys know that. Mm -hmm. If they have 10 times the capacity, I really believe their revenues were 10 times. And so they need capacity. This is no different than NVIDIA needs wafers from TSMC. Just because you know NVIDIA exists and, and we're doing great doesn't mean we don't need capacity. We need capacity. We need capacity of DRAM. We need, and so in our world, it's sensible to everybody. We need capacity. Well, in their world, they need factories. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have factory capacity, how they generate tokens, which is where we started our conversation today. And so they need factory capacity in order to increase their revenue growth. But nonetheless, we also said that AI is more than chatbots. It includes all these different fields of science. Um, NVIDIA's AV business is coming up on $10 billion. Nobody ever talks about that. <laughs> and because you have to train world models, you have to train these AI AVs, and it's happening, robo taxis happening all over the world. Our AI work with uh, digital biology, our AI work in financial services, the whole industry of quants, quantitative trading is moving it's towards. A huge shift. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There used to be classical machine learning, a whole bunch of human featured, they mm -hmm. call quants, right? These, these, specialized mathematicians were trying to figure out what the predictive features are. Now we use AI to figure it out. And so in order to have, instead of having quants, you need a lot of supercomputers. Financial services is one of our fastest growing segments. Billions of dollars in, in quants, you know, in financial services. Billions of dollars in AV. Billions of dollars in robotics coming up. Billions of dollars in digital biology. So his point is pretty simple. This isn't a hype bubble. It's a capacity problem. Demand isn't collapsing, it's actually outrunning the infrastructure. And as you're about to see, he approaches the job loss question with this same kind of framing. Not what jobs get replaced, but what industries expand. Take a look. If, I, if NVIDIA was more productive, it doesn't result in layoffs. It results in us doing more, more things. I met your new hire yeah. class today. You oh, seem to right? be <laughs> hiring every week anyway. Yeah, and That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. The, the more productive we are, the more uh, ideas we can explore, uh, the more growth as, as a result, the more profitable we become, which allows us to pursue more ideas. And so I think you're, you're absolutely right that, that if, if the job, if, if, your, if your life, if the world, the problems is literally already specified, and there's no other problem to solve, then productivity would actually reduce the economy. But it's clearly going to increase the economy. I think that the next part that I would consider is, you know, people say, gosh, all of these robots that we're talking about, is going to take away jobs. As, as we know very clearly, we don't have enough factory workers. Our economy is actually limited by the number of factory workers we have. Most people are, are having a very hard time retaining their workers. Um, we also know that the number of truck drivers in the world is mm. severely short. And the reason for that is people don't want those jobs 
where you have to travel across the country and live in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, you know, every single night. And so people want to stay in their town, stay with their families. So I think the, I think the first part is that having robotic systems is going to allow us to cover the labor shortage gap, which is really, really severe and getting worse because of aging population. Mm-hmm. This is this is not only in the United States, it's all over the world, as you guys know. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to cover the labor shortage. But the second part that people forget, and, and as a result, we'll go and, the and there, are, there are shortages as well in other places that people talk about AI being relevant. Accounting would be an example where there's shortages there. Nursing is another example. So, so you, you know, you can you can go through multiple other industries and say, okay, there's That's gaps. Right. And the AI is trying to help fill those gaps. That's exactly right. And so, so um, automation is going to help us increase and solve the, the 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 labor gap. Now, people also don't don't remember that when we have cars, we need mechanics to take care of our cars. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the robo taxis that are that are even on the streets today, it's taken ten years for that to happen. Look at all the maintenance crews and all of the 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 various you know. A hubs that they're in where you have to take care of these robo taxis and just imagine we have a billion robots mm-hmm. it's going to be the largest repair industry on the planet so i, I think a lot of people don't they, they just have to think through mm-hmm. and this is the part where you said um, when we create this type of automation we create this other job mm-hmm. right now look at ai is creating so many jobs mm-hmm. the ai industry is creating a boom of jobs so yeah i definitely agree with him to an extent His argument is basically that increased productivity doesn't shrink the economy, it expands it, often in ways we haven't even thought through yet, like the emergence of entirely new industries, say a massive robot repair industry for all the robots we're going to have. And he also points to a bunch of sectors that are already facing real shortages, nursing, healthcare, truck driving, manufacturing, that would honestly benefit from a wave of digital workers coming in to help. But what he doesn't really talk about is the long term. Because yes, AI will create new jobs, entirely new industries, and it will absolutely fill gaps in areas that need it badly. But what happens when AI can truly do any job better than a human, including the new ones it creates, and human labor starts to become a net negative? At that point, we're no longer just talking about expanding industries. We're talking about fundamentally changing what work even means, and by extension, our entire way of living and what it means to be human in this day and age. Now, we'll save the existential talk for another video, because one of the big things Jensen keeps emphasizing in this interview is that a lot of the AI narratives floating around right now, on both sides, are just way too extreme. Check this out. I think the counter narrative here that is worth addressing is that essentially like, you know, there should be a monolithic vertical player and monolithic asset in the like one model that does it all. Mm -hmm. And that we can't give away that crown jewel to Mm -hmm. other countries or non-American companies. Mm -hmm. And and your your argument is like we actually need this huge diversity of AI applications. And and the American advantage is actually or any any sovereign advantages in the whole stack. Right, mm-hmm. the capability to deliver any piece of it. I guess someday we will have God AI. Mm-hmm. But when is that day? But but that someday that someday is probably on b- biblical scales. You know, I think galactic scales. Um, I I think it's it, it's not helpful to go from where we are today to God AI. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I don't think any company practically believes they're anywhere near God AI. And uh, nor nor do I do I see any researchers having any reasonable ability to create God AI. The ability to under, understand human language and genome language and molecular language and protein language and amino acid language and physics language all supremely well. Mm-hmm. That God AI just doesn't exist. And and yet we have a lot of industries that need AI. Mm-hmm. AI is, if if you will. At the simplistic level, it's just the next computer industry. Mm-hmm. And give me an example of a company, an industry, a nation who doesn't need computers. Mm-hmm. And we all don't have to wait around for God AI for us to advance, right? So God AI is not showing up next week. I'm fairly certain of that. Okay, and God, very- AI, God AI is not, not going to show up next year, but the whole world needs to move forward next week, next year, next mm-hmm. decade. 
I think that that the idea of a monolithic, gigantic company, mm-hmm. country, nation state that has got AI is just it's unhelpful. Too, it's unhelpful. It's too extreme. Mm-hmm. Then, in fact, if you want to take it to that level, then we ought to just all stop everything. What's the point of having even governments? I mean, why, why, why are they doing policies? God AI is going to be smart enough to avert, you know, work around any policy. And so what's the point? And so I, I think that, that we ought to bring things back to the ground, ground level, and start thinking about things practically and, and use common sense. So the takeaway there is pretty simple. We don't need to wait around for some mythical God AI to show up before things start changing in very real ways. And as Jensen puts it, thinking about AI like that is actually kind of unhelpful. It pushes the conversation to an extreme that just isn't grounded in where the technology actually is. Now, obviously, that's his take. You can agree or disagree. But I actually think it's far more likely we see a bunch of domain-specific superintelligences emerge first, rather than one single system that can do everything. It's just more practical. And that's exactly why in this next clip, he points to very specific fields that he thinks are about to have their own ChatGPT moment, starting with digital biology. Do you have any thoughts or predictions in terms of what the next breakthrough industries will be or new applications or areas that you're most excited about coming in 26 in particular? Like are there one or two things that you think will... Because of three things. I, because of, uh, uh, because of a, a couple, two, three things. I, I, think, I think several industries are going are gonna to experience their ChatGPT moment. Um, I believe that multi-modality and um, very long context is going to enable, of course, really, really cool chatbots. Um, but the basic architecture, that in combination with breakthroughs in synthetic data generation is going to help create the chat GPT moment for digital biology. Mm-hmm. That moment is coming. And by digital biology, do you specifically mean... Other aspects of like protein folding and protein binding or protein do you mean diagnosis? I see protein synthesis. I think we're good at protein understanding. Mm-hmm. Now, multi-protein understanding is coming online. And we recently created a model called La Proteina. It's open. Um, it's for multi-protein mm-hmm. um, understanding and, and represent, representation learning and generation. Uh, so so I think that, that protein understanding is, is advancing very quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, protein generation is going to advance very quickly. Chat GPT moment, uh, proteins. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting companies working on molecule design in an end-to-end way, like That's Chai. Right. Such, exactly. Yeah. And then, and then of course, chemical understanding and chemical generation. Mm-hmm. And then protein, chemical yeah. confirmation, understanding, and generation. Mm-hmm. Is that right? And so that combination, the chat GPT moment, the generative AI moment, all of that stuff is coming together for, for um, digital biology. So I think this part honestly gets understated. I mean, we're talking about AI being able to simulate biology. And once you can do that, the implications go way beyond just better drugs. This is why people start saying things like AI could cure all disease, massively accelerate climate solutions, or even change how we think about aging. And that's honestly just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, think about it this way. Our biology is essentially our programming. It's the software we run on. And if we can now simulate that software, edit it, stress test it, and see the outcomes in real time, then yeah, things get very weird, very fast. And what's wild is that this isn't staying in the lab. Jensen says the same shift that's happening in biology is starting to happen in the physical world too. Once you add reasoning, memory, and long horizon planning, AI stops being just software and starts becoming something that can act. And that's where cars and robots come in. The, the, this, the second area that I'm excited about, um, of course, reasoning made huge breakthroughs in language, but because of reasoning, cars are going to be able to perform better. So instead of just perception cars mm-hmm. and planning cars, they're gonna be reasoning cars. So these cars are gonna be thinking all the time. And when they come up, they come up to a, a circumstance they, they've never in, encountered before they can break it down into circumstances they have encountered before Mm -hmm. and construct a reason reasoning system for how to navigate through it and so the out of domain out of you know out of distribution Mm -hmm. part of ai is going to very much be be addressed by reasoning systems or and as a result we could do more things than what we're taught to do between uh generative ai uh 
and um, multimodal, uh, you know, vision, language, action models, and reasoning systems. I think we're going to see big breakthroughs in humanoid robots or multi embodiment robots. You know, it does. So yeah, we already know Nvidia is heavily invested in what they call the era of physical AI. And the emergence of reasoning systems is what Jensen thinks will take us to the next step. As you guys know, I'm also super bullish on humanoid robots and autonomous vehicles. And I personally think we will see the physical AI ChatGPT moment before the digital biology one, whatever that ends up being. So at the end of the day, whether you agree with Jensen or not, the big takeaway from this interview is pretty clear. AI isn't just one thing. It's not just a model or a chatbot. And it's definitely not some mythical god AI that shows up overnight. It's more like a stack, a set of capabilities. And it's already reshaping biology, work, and the physical world right now. Probably a lot more than you think, but maybe not as much as the people on X seem to think. Anyways, if you want more breakdowns like this, grounded, not just pure hype or pure doom, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Also, let me know in the comments what you're most excited about. Robots, digital biology, or something else entirely. And as always, I'll be catching you guys in the next one.